So um, I normally speak uh, at local government conferences. And one of the advantages about speaking at local government conferences is that people who work in local government aren't really capable of speaking in public, in my experience. Uh, and so I'm always on after people who've been really terrible. <laughs> and so I had assumed I was a really good speaker because I've only ever been on after. And now I've watched those two presentations and I've realized that I'm not actually a very good public speaker at all when I'm on after two people who've been really entertaining and really engaging. So I've changed my mind six times about what I was going to say to you. Um, and I don't know what I'm going to say and I don't really know what I think until I say it. And then when I've said it, I'll believe it. So. Um, Let's talk about why Brexit happened, and, and I think um, it's quite interesting. There's a kind of culture war even around that question right now, um, because those people, as we have done tonight, who fall into the assumption that everyone who voted to leave voted to leave because they're suffering from kind of alienation, misery, um, exclusion. Uh, can be very easily caricatured by pro-Brexit people as this is just yet more evidence of the elitism of those people. In fact, I spoke to someone the other day, um, and she said, and she was absolutely looking me in the eye when she said it, she said, every single person who voted to leave knew all the facts and had spent a lot of time on the internet and had thought it through. And this assumption that Brexit is some kind of sign of social decay is a kind of hyper version of the elitism that led to uh, the decision in the first place, people not listening. So I think you've got to be careful about this. I think we have to be careful about what we're saying about what happened in Brexit and careful about the assumption that, that people who did so were suffering from kind of massive false consciousness. Having said which, if you look at the, the data and who voted, it is clear that quite a lot of people who voted, and certainly enough people to make a difference, um, are people who have been basically screwed by a combination of globalization and a particular kind of neoliberal ideology and a particular form of financialized capitalism. Um, I'm not, I'm not, by the way, I'm not a Corbynista, I'm a Blairite. So, you know, when I say these things, I'm not going to go into a kind of trope and, uh, that you can recognize. Well, maybe I am, but I, uh, you know, I'm politically moderate, but I think that what Brexit did was remind us, uh, because we do forget it a bit, how badly some people have, um, how badly some people have done in the last few years. So. In those places that overwhelmingly voted against, like um, West Bromwich, which I go to quite a lot, and uh, places in the northeast and parts of Wales as well, um, you do have people who have suffered from rising levels of inequality. And in, although inequality is an abstract word, it's real, and the evidence shows that it's real. That if you know that other people are doing much better than you, it is painful. They've suffered from stagnant living standards. So had economic, had living standards continued to rise from 2008 until now at the same rate as they rose before, then average families, average families would be £8,000 a year better off. So these, you know, that, that's average families are £8,000 a year less well off than they would have been had economic growth continued since 2008. In fact, there's been no improvement at all in people's living standards. These communities have also suffered from a, a, a fragmenting of the public sphere. The quality of public services and what is available to them has declined. And they've also suffered from stuff happening to them which they feel they have no control over, for which migration appears as a kind of totem of that kind of sense. People use this phrase, there's been a lot of change around here, to, to describe that things have happened which they don't feel they necessarily chose and they're not sure about. So, if you take that perspective, then you need to connect the Brexit vote to other things. You need to connect it to the Trump phenomenon, as we have been hearing. You need, in a way, to connect it to the Corbyn phenomenon of the Labour Party abandoning, in a sense, the desire to win power in favour of the desire to take a stand 
uh, the rise of populism and extremism in, in various places. I don't think you should overstate that. Uh, it is still the case that moderate parties still just about tend to win elections, but there's clearly something going on, and that stuff that's going on is dangerous. And Martin Wolf, in the Financial Times a couple of weeks ago, reminded us of something that, that again, we forget, which is that the marriage between uh, economic liberalism and democracy is not guaranteed to be successful. Uh, that at various times in the history of uh, capitalist democracies, things have fallen apart, as they did, for example, in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and also, not only are there real issues about the degree to which economic liberalism and democracy are working together now in the West, you've also got in China and Russia alternative models which combine economic liberalism and social authoritarianism. And they're not necessarily doing worse than us in many ways. So you've got problems with our system and you've got an alternative. So Martin Wolf says we shouldn't take it for granted that this relationship is going to endure. And if it doesn't endure, we're in a lot of trouble. So how should we understand what's wrong? Now, we can understand what's wrong in a whole variety of different ways, but um, I'm going to offer you a bit of kind of theory, if that's all right, for what's going on. I mean, you've had a lot of stuff about branding and things like that, and so I'm just going, in a desperate attempt to find a niche, I'm going quite deep, <laughs> if that's okay. So, um, so here's a way of thinking about, about why societies work and why they don't work. And, and by the way, it's also a way of understanding why policies work and don't work, and even, in a way, why people don't work and do work. But let's just focus on, on societies. So basically, there are um, four ways of thinking about change that, that, that we have as human beings. And they are deeply evolved in us. Um, and at various times, these different ways of thinking about how change happens or more exactly thinking about how we do stuff together, um, various forms have been dominant. So these four ways of thinking, just that this, is the, this is the only bit you really have to follow, because if you don't follow this bit, you won't get the next six and a half minutes. But, um, so those four ways are these. One way is the hierarchical way. So the hierarchical way says that the way that we do stuff together and the way that change happens is through hierarchical things. So that's leadership and authority and expertise and rules and regulations and bureaucracy and all that kind of stuff. And then the second way of thinking about how change happens and how we should do stuff together, and these are, these are both way, and forms of analysis, but they're also things that we, you know, that, we, that we can argue for politically, is solidarity. So solidarity says the way we get stuff done together is because we share things. We share values. We're members of the same tribe. Uh, we have kind of reciprocity between us, a certain amount of justice between us. People think solidarity is a left-wing idea, but actually solidarity is what drives racism because it's our tribe versus your tribe. So it's as much, you see solidarity in kind of radical trade unionism, but you also see it in a kind of BMP rally or whatever. And then the third way of thinking about change is individualism, which is that in the end, the way that change happens, the way we get stuff done, is by creating, maximizing the space for people themselves to pursue their own interests and do their own things. And that's what drives change in the world. And the fourth way of thinking is Fatalism and fatalism says, well, we don't really, it's really hard to get people to do things together. Progress is really difficult, and even if it happens, we're all still going to die. Uh, and don't underestimate that, by the way, as, as a part of the way in which we all think about the world, although we repress it. Although I'm thinking about it quite a lot because I'm, I'm quite old. Um, so uh, if you think about what works in societies, what tends to work best in our kind of world is when you manage to combine uh, effective hierarchy, so effective forms of leadership, expertise and authority, with forms of solidarity which are sufficiently robust for people to do things together but aren't kind of insular and defensive but are kind of outward looking and optimistic, with space for individualism, for space for creativity and enterprise and people to pursue their own ambitions. That's basically the recipe that works. Um, and when we do that, we're incredibly dynamic. So if you look at the human race, basically nothing really happened for the first 80,000 years 
And the reason for that is because we lived in almost entirely solidaristic hunter-gatherer communities. There really wasn't much hierarchy in those communities, and there was not much individualism. There's no point accumulating when you were a hunter-gatherer because you couldn't keep stuff, right? We then move into a long period that starts... This is quite big, isn't it, the scale of this, what I'm doing? It's quite good, isn't it? Um, the, then you, then you, you move to civilization, which starts in around 6,000 years BC, and um, you then move into a period of hierarchy. So until we get to the Enlightenment, hierarchy is dominant. So systems uh, are managed on the basis that there is a hierarchy stretching from God right down to kind of peasants and serfs and slaves. And so society is held together by hierarchy. That's a slightly more dynamic system, but it's still not that dynamic. You know, we can still, in that hierarchically dominated system, go hundreds of years without virtually any economic growth or any improvements in public health or things like that, and civilizations wax and wane. There's a lot of war as well, because in hierarchical systems, the hierarchies are kind of constantly fragmenting and fighting each other. And then we move into the modern era, and individualism asserts itself from the Enlightenment onwards. Individualism was always in us. It's our kind of survival mechanism. But then it asserts itself as a cultural force, a massive cultural force, and then, of course, economically through modern capitalism. And at certain times, those things came together really effectively. I would argue, for example, in the post-Second World, Second World War era, you had authority that was reasonably self-confident. People deferred to a certain extent. There was a sense of the possibility of strong leadership, effective leadership. We had strike, quite strong class-based solidarity. And there was individualism. Um, there was creativity, but the market didn't have its kind of destructive capacities that it now has. It wasn't fun and it wasn't financialized as well. The capitalism of the post-war era was about making things uh, rather than just about money. I mean, the dominant form of capitalism moment is just about money. The most powerful bits of capitalism are just about money. So um, what I would argue is that uh, the underlying problem that we have at the moment in our kind of society, which I think Brexit highlighted to a certain extent, but more the underlying, it, the underlying factors, it shed, shed light on what was really going on, is that we live in a society where hierarchies are weak, where people have lost their faith in leadership, where authority struggles, where people who work in big corporations are constantly stunned by how incredibly crap the management of those corporations are, where we it's probably different in your world, but most people have got more computing power in their pocket than they're allowed to use at work. You know? So we, we live in a world of hierarchy you know, and trust in all sorts of leaders, political leaders, corporate leaders, even charitable leaders, in decline. A, a loss of faith in expertise. You know, Michael Gove, he didn't say, he didn't say, you know, I don't really believe we should, I don't think we should listen to experts accidentally. You know, he said it because he knows experts has become a kind of dirty word for people. So hierarchy is problematic. Solidarity too. Um, people have lost that sense of being part of a community, as we heard brilliantly from Helen. Helen, is that right? Yeah. I mean, I thought that was what your presentation was all about. It was all about the fragmenting of solidarity. And you were arguing then, how can we renew solidarity? But you see, solidarity, basically human solidarity is based upon liking people like ourselves. That's how it has evolved in us, and we now have to learn forms of solidarity based on liking people who are not like ourselves, and that's a big stretch. for the, It's not impossible, and we can do it, but, it, but it's difficult. And so what you've got with solidarity fragmented and hierarchy weak is you just open up a space which has become dominated by individualism. And neoliberalism, which is a terrible bit of political jargon, but neoliberalism is an ideology that basically says that's absolutely fine. All we need is individualism. Individualism will solve the world's problems. You know, uh, strong corporations, free markets, and people just pursuing their own stuff. And if the people get really rich, then they'll drag up some of the poor at the same time. So the kind of neoliberal philosophy is based on the idea that it's absolutely fine for individualism to be dominant. And my view is it isn't. And, it's not, I don't, and I'm not saying this ethically, although I worry about the ethical consequences of individuals. I just don't think it is enough. I think if we live in societies where we don't really trust authority and authority doesn't really work, and where we don't have a sufficient sense of solidarity, those societies are fragile. And that fragility is what we saw in Brexit, because the thing about Brexit was that the public, 52% of the public, ignored what 98% of the establishment was saying. And that is not a good position to be in. Um, because... Uh, you know, that level of disenchantment, disillusionment, um, you know, th that any society where people feel so much contempt for people in authority uh, is in an enfeebled situation. 
So how do we rebuild this? And I'll, I'll, I'll finish with this. Um, so I, I, I think we have to rebuild it through projects, through projects which rekindle the sense that it is possible for us to do things together, to choose to do things, and that to empower people in authority. We always talk about empowering citizens, but it's really, I mean, I can tell you, I work for politicians. They're all terrified all the time. We can empower people in authority to make brave decisions in ways which recalibrate this unbalanced position that we're in. And so the idea that's in my mind at the moment, and it wasn't there even just a few weeks ago, really, but it's, it came, it was like a kind of, I was on holiday and it just kind of came. <laughs> um, so the RSA, my organization, which is a fantastic organization, and, and spends a lot of time thinking about different ways of thinking about change. Because, partly because of the reasons I've described, most attempts at social change fail. Most policy fails. Most social innovation fails to scale. You know, huge, huge amount of time and effort is, meant to, is spent trying to make the world a better place, and 99% of it falls on its ass. Um, and most, most, I mean, the most national political po policy, most governmental policy fails. It either fails really big or it just, it's just a damp squib. So we have to have the project, a project. And I'm a supporter, the RSA is a supporter of universal basic income. Now, you know, I like universal basic income. I think it's a good idea. And this is the idea that you pay every citizen uh, a sort of basic allowance, enough to live on, very little job seekers allowance level, but just enough to live on and you pay it unconditionally to everybody. And I quite like the policy because I think it's clever and I think it's what we need because of the fact we live in a world of you know, the gig economy, people, you know, massive job insecurity, people shifting jobs all the time, different kind of lifestyles, almost all the, in fact, the entire growth in jobs over the last 10 years can be accounted for by, by jobs which are part-time or which are temporary or which are gig work or which are self-employment. So this is the labor market's changing and the idea of people having to sign on and sign off benefits all the time and to lose their benefits if they get a bit of work. So, you know, so I thought it was a good policy, a technocratically good policy, but the thing that I, I realized is that I'm not trying to sell UBI, well I am trying to sell it to you I suppose, but the point about UBI that I realised, and I, spoke, I did my annual lecture at the RSA last, last week about this, is that actually I do want UBI, but I don't want it to be a policy, I want it to be a movement. So uh, what excites me about UBI is that, you, is that you can't believe in it really unless you're willing to challenge certain assumptions that we have, assumptions about the fact that people are kind of naturally lazy. Um, uh, uh, the, the assumption, in a sense, that people have to be kind of screwed down. Um, one of the other things that, one of the things that UBI does is it makes people a little bit strong, makes employees a little bit stronger uh, because they're less terrified of what happens if they lose their work. So it, it encourages to, us, us to, va to value things we don't value enough, like volunteering and like caring. Um, it, it speaks to the fact that everybody, not just people like us, but everybody would like an opportunity at some point in their lives to pursue a project, to, to set up a business, to retrain, to do something different, you know, to have that sense of kind of agency. Uh, so in my annual lecture last week, I said that if Theresa May ran me tomorrow and said, I've read your pamphlet about universal basic income, I want to do it, I'd say to her, no, don't do it, don't do it. Don't do it now, because it would just be a policy. What we need to do is we need to build a movement around this, because it needs to become a symbol of the fact that we can still do big things. That, that actually we can support politicians, people in authority, democratically elected people, to do big, bold things which challenge a set of assumptions about society and say, no, actually we'll do this thing, we'll do it right, and we'll do it because actually we respect all citizens and we think that there is, a, there is we will express solidarity to each other and say every single citizen needs to have the capacity to be able to just about survive uh, and to have the freedom to do that and we trust people to make wise choices if that is to happen. And that, so um, I think we are in a bad way. I think Brexit indicates the kind of lack of balance in our society. And I think we can talk about it and talk about it. But in the end, if we're going to come out of it, it will probably because, be because we define projects which stand for the possibility of getting that balance right uh, again. So thank you.